This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening. Welcome to the CAPS Forum on Ethics and Public Policy. It's a triannual event uh, bringing in the distinguished speakers to speak to and interact with um, undergraduates and members of the community, but undergraduates from various um, disciplines that are interested in a common uh, theme. So tonight we have three different courses in um, pre-med and uh, biomedical research. Um, we have some a small group from uh, philosophy and the moral sentiments, um, a group from uh, Buddhist ethics representing uh, religious studies, and my own course on biomedical ethics, um, which uh, my director sometimes calls the ethics of bumping people off. There will be interaction, um, a question period, I see a number of people from the community. I see some medical doctors here that I know you'd have a love, love to have a, a go at uh, um, Dr. Youngner. Um, but I ask in the spirit of the event that we give the undergraduates the first shot at asking questions and then we'll open it up uh, to general discussion. Um, <clears throat> And before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kathy Foltz and the other faculty that are participating to help make this event a su success. I'd like to thank Leonard Wallach and all the members of the, the CAPS crew, and of course also our technical crew, um, Todd and his group that are working really hard behind the scenes to make this possible in a seemingly seamless event. And if, if it's not seamless, Todd, uh, you'll fix it in post-production, I'm sure. And I'd also finally like to thank all the young, healthy students with their sense of immortality um, who are still grappling with beginning of life issues, including writing term papers on the ethics of bumping people off this weekend. And of course, I want to thank our speaker for coming all the way from Cleveland to brave the harsh realities of the Santa Barbara winter. It did actually rain last week, and I, I had to cancel a class for inclement weather conditions. <laughs> Tonight, we're privileged and honored to have Dr. Stuart Youngner, Professor of psych, uh, Psychiatry, and Susan E. Watson, Professor of Bioethics, also Chair of that department, um, at Case Western U Reserve University. Dr. Youngner is an internationally renowned scholar in biomedical ethics and has published over 90 articles on topics such as the ethics of organ transplant, advanced directives, end-of-life decision-making, and defining the very notion of death. Dr. Youngner serves on the editorial advisory boards of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, and the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. He has served as a consultant to the Institute of Medicine, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and the United States Congress Office of Technology and Assessment. He has served as president of the Society for Bioethics Consultation and is on the board of directors of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. And there's a bunch of other stuff that I gotta skip. Um, uh, he has nine books, including The Definition of Death, Contemporary Controversies, and his latest book, Physician Assisted P uh, Death in Perspective, Assessing the Dutch Experience. Tonight, he will speak about decisions at the end of life, the illusion of control, 
and the sense of responsibility. Please welcome Dr. Stuart Youngner. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Terrific. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here as a guest of the CAP Center. And uh, I've, uh, I've had lunch in Santa Barbara and driven through it several times. And boy, it's nice to be here. Uh, I left Cleveland today. We had a warm morning. It was 19 degrees. It's been below zero uh, on many mornings. So this morning was like, wow, oh, spring is, might be coming soon. Uh, I, I guess we have an hour and a half all together here. Yeah, I, I'd like to leave 30 minutes for discussion. Oh, I wasn't. Uh, don't, don't worry. Okay. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> I actually was going to say uh, I, I, this is a, a fairly intimate group, and uh, I, I really welcome. I'm not going to talk for an hour and a half, uh, but I, in the in the time that I do talk, I really welcome questions. Uh, so raise your hand shout, I don't know, whatever you want to do. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to interrupt uh, what I'm saying and, uh, and answer questions as we go along. And I hope that you feel free to, to ask them. So um, death and dying in the United States. So in, in a sense, I'm going to be talking about my own personal journey uh, on this topic, because I've been around for a while and actually lived through some significant changes in the way we think about death and talk about death. Um, and in many ways, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so the first I'm going to talk, thing I'm going to talk about is the period of, uh, of hopelessness, denial, and silence, which I think existed for quite a while, uh, certainly before I was born. And uh, I went to medical school, uh, started medical school in 1966. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about what the culture was like right then and how it began, began to change very quickly. Um, so in the 60s, Kubler-Ross, uh, you all know Kubler-Ross? Uh, she was sort of the Masters and Johnson of death. <laughs> you know, Woody Allen always talks about sex and death being, and Freud uh, being the, the big, big things. And it's interesting. Um, uh, did any of you see the series on uh, Showtime about uh, called Masters of Sex? It was actually pretty good. I was I was a little reluctant to watch it, but it was about these two pioneers that began studying sex as if it was actually uh, a physical uh, and physiologic phenomenon, which of course it is. And we were understanding a lot about the heart and the lungs and other things, but nobody really studied sex. And they started doing it. It was very controversial, and they were very complicated uh, people with a complicated relationship. Kubler-Ross was kind of a person like that, in a way, as many uh, pathfinders are. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to come back to talk about her. So then we're going to talk about the high-tech age, which we're still in, and which also started very early in my medical career. Uh, really. Uh, the last uh, year or two that I, I was in medical school, and certainly in, the, uh, in my training, I did an internship in pediatrics and a residency in psychiatry starting from 70 to 74. And the high-tech intensive care unit thing really started up uh, big time um, then. Um, so then the idea was defeating death. And then after not too long uh, a, a time of having machines that could keep people alive who would have died otherwise, uh, we found out that that wasn't always what they wanted or even what we wanted for them. And, and we recognized that death may be the least worst alternative sometimes. It's not what we want, uh, but it's uh, among the choices we have. It's not the worst. And. Uh, and then uh, the control we have with technology over the timing of death um, is something that's been a, a major factor in discussions uh, in 
in the hospital and other places where technology is available. And then we're going to talk very briefly about the future, where I think the, the uh, economic factors that uh, are going to force us to ration uh, care at the end of life uh, will coexist with uh, increasing ways to extend it. So that's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting future. OK, let's talk about this period. So uh, I'll start in a very personal way. Um, uh, my mother was uh, 18 when I was born. And she was diagnosed with cancer after my birth. She had a form of Hodgkin's disease, which uh, quite treatable now, uh, curable, uh, wasn't curable then. So she really was sick, very sick, on and off, uh, until she died when I was 18. And so I lived with a very sick mother with a very bad diagnosis. Uh, they didn't know that much about the prognosis. I think she lived a lot longer than they thought she would. And she had horrible treatments, really nasty. I mean, they're all nasty now, too. But these were really nasty uh, treatments. And uh, we never talked about it. Never, never discussed it. And we never, when it became clear she was going to die pretty soon, we never talked about that. Uh, so we, my life was uh, not atypical uh, of, of the way things were handled then and, uh, and are still today uh, in, to some extent. But uh, it certainly was formative for me, a formative experience. Um, uh, let me go back. So when I went to medical school, um, uh, I was interested in this topic. Uh, and I think most medical students are. I mean, it's, uh, you go into medicine in a way to, to fight death, to fight dying, to, to reverse these things. And uh, I'll never forget. And, and it, it, this may, may sound almost uh, like a fake story to you, especially if you're young. But uh, we had a special lecture in my second year by the chairman of the Department of Medicine, who was a, an, a hematologist, oncologist, who took care of people with uh, blood cancers. And a very, very uh, accomplished, respected guy, a good guy. Uh, and he gave us a lecture about how you deal with patients who are dying. And the message was, you lie to them. You don't tell them that they have cancer. Uh, and he, um, he went so far as to say that he had had patients who were sophisticated or doctors, and he would actually write false things in the chart on the case, on the chance that they would look at the chart. I mean, I don't know how many work in a hospital setting today, but you know. You, I mean, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is risk management and all that kind of stuff, you, this would be impossible to do today. But that's, that's what he told us. And he, to, he, he actually brought out five or six of his patients to interview in front of us. And he told them things like, well, you have a blood problem or whatever. And he brought them out. And the ones he picked uh, were uh, seemed pretty happy. I mean, they, they were OK. They weren't suffering at that particular time. And he talked to them. And the point was, look how happy they are. And, and it's because I didn't tell them. I lied to them. Uh, so it wasn't just not withholding information. It was, it was an advocating of lying about this. Uh, Bald-faced, absolutely no qualifications. And nobody raised their hand and said, what? Are you kidding me? Are, that's wrong. Uh, that's not going to work, uh, whatever. But that was, that was actually, you know, that was a big thing in the medical school for him to give this lecture. Well, it, w it was right about that time that the Kubler-Ross book came out. And uh, I don't know how many of you remember the, the beginning of the book where she talks about how she got started, but she was in Chicago, and I can't remember what hospital it was. And she went to people and said, I'd like to talk to dying patients. And they said, well, actually, we don't have any dying patients in our hospital. 
Now, actually, today, that might be true, because anybody who anybody admits is dying is sent out of the hospital, because it's too expensive <coughs> to keep them there. Um, I remember making rounds uh, as a third year student, uh, and, and there would be a patient whose door was closed. And when we made rounds, we didn't go in. And the doctor would say, this person's dying. Door was closed. And uh, if you worked on the ward and had to go in there for some reason, uh, the, the lights were turned off, the shades were pulled down. I mean, it was really creepy. It was, they, they were just completely isolated in that way. <coughs> And, and then Kubler-Ross's book came out, and basically the message was uh, people are dying, and people who are dying have needs. The conspiracy of silence is a bad idea. Uh, one of the justifications that physicians gave, and of course this, the lecture that we had, is that if you tell patients the truth, it upsets them. They don't want you to tell them the truth. And there were a couple studies done back then where they asked patients if they'd want to know, and like 95% of them said, yes, I want somebody to talk to me. And, and when you think about it, uh, it's, it's such a, uh, it may be a culturally feasible way to deal with dying patients, but if somebody has cancer and they're dying, they know they're sick. I mean, it's not like they think they have a cold. They're, they're, your body feels different. And um, the people around you who know that you have cancer, do you think they act exactly the same? They look, when they look you in the eyes, that they're you know, looking you in the eyes as if you were healthy? So people know that something's going on. And they may not know exactly what it is, they may not be able to articulate it, or they may very well be able to articulate it, and they know that they're not supposed to talk about it. That that's, and certainly not with their doctor, certainly not with this doctor. Actually, years later, <coughs> I was um, talking to a colleague who was about 10 years older than me, um, who had, had also been in the Department of Medicine when this uh, Dr. Weisberg Weisberger uh, was, uh, was chair, and we were talking about how he would, uh, what he, he did, and he told me the following story, that one of his colleagues, who was also a physician, uh, was dying of cancer and was a patient of uh, Dr. Weisberger's, and, and the patient had lunch with the guy I was talking to, this other guy I was talking to told me the story. They had lunch with this guy, and the guy was talking about his cancer. and. Uh, and the person telling me the story said, he said to him, well, how do you know that you have cancer? Did he tell you? And he said, oh, of course not. Well, I would never talk with him about it. It would upset him too much. <laughs> so um, for very complicated reasons, and there's a literature out there about it, doctors uh, really didn't like to talk to patients about death. And they lived in a culture where death wasn't discussed. You know, when I was in medical school and before, the word cancer never appeared in the newspaper. It, you never read a story about somebody dying of cancer. They were, it was a linger, somebody has a lingering illness, that was one of the metaphors or words that was you know, put out there. Uh, abortion was another word that never appeared in, in newspapers. Um, so Kubler-Ross really said, you know, this, this is just isn't working. Um, you know, if you go to a doctor, if you, if, you, if you really believe your doctor when he tells you you're, you're not dying or you don't have a bad diagnosis, is that exactly the same as when you go to the doctor with a cold and he tells you you're okay, that he looks the same way, it's the same experience? Of, of course it's not. And uh, Kubler-Ross talked to people. But even more important than talking, she listened to them. And people who are dying, whatever that means, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, really have a lot to say. They have a lot to worry about. And they can talk about it. And if you listen, they will talk to you. If you don't listen, 
if you talk over them, if you give out the message that this is forbidden, they won't talk to you. But she didn't do that, and she listened to them. And she wrote this book about what they said and how they reacted. Now, in retrospect, just like much of the research that Masters and Johnson did, uh, she oversimplified the whole process. You know, she had these stages, and uh, I, I remember, you know, people who read her then sort of tried to make patients go, you know, okay, it's time for the anger stage, uh, but you're not ready yet for the, you know, denial stage, you know. So, so the, it was like you had to work through these things. So it was a kind of a, a oversimplified mechanical, at least interpretation of what she did. But there were other people uh, who I think were, weren't the pathfinders like she was who uh, were more um, contemplative, uh, better academics, uh, who sat with dying patients and wrote about it. And there's some wonderful papers from then that, uh, that uh, I read uh, when I was uh, uh, in my first year of my psych residency. Uh, I was interested in consultation liaison psychiatry, which is the psychiatry where psychiatrists work in the medical and surgical parts of the hospital. And one of my mentors, uh, to, you know, we read, ha had reading assignments that, you know, turned me on to this literature. And it was, it was quite impressive. Um, it was, uh, so what, I'm going to try to distill uh, some of the things that I, uh, I got from that. Let me see if we're ready for this. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, so here were some of the things uh, that, that came out of that. Uh, one was um, there's always something that you can give to patients who are dying if you go and listen to them. And that, in fact, it can be often a much easier a form of gratification for the physician, and of course this would be true for a nurse or a social worker too, so I'm just talking about physicians here, uh, that, that you will find, you'll hear something and you will find a very easy and practical way to really help that person, uh, which is much different than, uh, say, as a psychiatrist, most patients, it doesn't work that way. Um, so that was, that was very interesting. And, uh, and th there, were, there was a guy named E. Mansell Pattison, uh, who was a psychologist who, who I, I remember this paper. And I, I'm talking about these two papers because uh, I, I read them and then I talked to dying patients and they seemed to be just right on about, about what was going on. So his point was, uh, Pattison was, you know, nobody really, when says, people say I'm afraid of dying, uh, well, nobody really knows what it's like to be dead. So what are you really afraid of? There's something you're afraid of or you're upset about or anxious about. And, uh, and you can actually get the patient to tell you what that is. So it might be that they're worried about pain. It might be that they're worried about leaving their family. It might be that they're worried about losing control. And sometimes they, they will tell you things where you can actually, if, if they're worried about pain, you can talk to them about controlling the pain. Uh, and that can be uh, tremendously helpful to them. Or if they're worried about spiritual issues, you can get uh, you know, a, a minister or a priest or a rabbi or whatever to come in and talk to them. So you, you really, it, it, it can be overwhelming. Uh, that's one of the other things I read. to, to be asked to talk to a dying patient, one of the first reactions that people have often is, oh my God, what am I going to do? I can't help them. They're dying. And, you know, I'm a doctor, and uh, what, there's nothing I can do. This is, why, why would I want to talk to somebody who's dying? Because what can I do to help them? And that, um, that you, you really can help them. Uh, but it's interesting, I talked to many people who were dying. I was, as a psychiatrist, I, I had an interest in this, so I was asked often to, to do it. And I, I, I never got over having that first reaction, which was, I don't want to do this. What am I, what am I going to, what am I possibly going to have to give this person? 
So I want to tell you a story about, uh, th this is a very dramatic story, and uh, all the cases uh, uh, that I dealt with weren't quite this dramatic, but since this is a, a talk and I want to keep your attention and keep you from going to sleep, I'm going to tell you a dramatic story. So I was asked to see a woman by an oncologist, and she was dying of metastatic breast cancer. And uh, she was very anxious. She couldn't sleep, and she was just terrified. And he asked me to go speak with her, and I went and talked with her, and she was extremely anxious. She was lying in bed. She was, uh, you know, she wasn't an extremist. She, her prognosis was weeks or a couple months. Um, and I talked to her and listened to her, and it turned out that here's what she was really worried about. She uh, and her husband had uh, purchased pl a plot next to each other, plots next to each other at a cemetery uh, in Cleveland. And uh, her parents, who were both dead, were in a cemetery 100 miles away. And she was very, very scared of being buried and being all by herself. And she really wanted to be buried next to her parents. And she was very, very concerned that it would hurt her husband horribly. And she couldn't make that request to him. So I talked with her, and I suggested that you know, she needed to have that conversation with him, and let's see, you know, we can deal. If he gets really upset, then, I, you know, we'll talk about that, and I'll try to help you with that. But why don't you give it a try? And uh, when I came back to see her the next time, she had talked to her husband, and he was very accepting of it. And she was much calmer, much calmer. She was changed. And uh, but here's, here's the sort of twilight zone part of this story. So uh, when I knocked on her door to go in, she said, come in. And I went in, and she said, uh, do, do you smell chlorine? And I said, no. And we sat, and she told me about her conversation with her husband. And periodically, she'd go, don't you smell chlorine? And I'm thinking, OK, is she having olfactory hallucinations? Is my nose plugged up? I, I, you know, what, I, 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 I just didn't smell it. So, you know, being a good psychiatrist, I said, "So, tell me about chlorine." And then she told me the story that her father worked in a factory where he was exposed to chlorine all day, and he'd come home in his work clothes, and she loved her father, and she'd be waiting for him, and when he came in the door. She'd run to hug him and smell chlorine. So, you know, the interpretation is pretty obvious that she saw me as somebody like her father who was very helpful to her and, and helped her with this problem. So that, I mean, that was an amazing experience for me. And I really, I, I think I really helped her. And there were, there were other patients like that more, in more complicated ways. That was sort of a, you know, a quickie, right? I mean, I talked with her a couple times, found it out, and so forth. Uh, but it, 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 it really uh, was extremely gratifying to do. It was also took a lot out of me. It took a lot out of me. And um, I really stopped doing it. I stopped. And I stopped because it took a toll on me. Now, I could get on the couch, and we could try to figure out what that had to do with my mother. And maybe my interest in talking with dying patients had to do with the fact that I never talked with my mother about her dying. I'm sure that's true. But for whatever the reasons, or I don't have the right constitution uh, for it, uh, one of the things that it, that experience made me uh, made me a little more humble because I had uh, often was had been called by oncologists who were absolutely horrible about talking to their patients. They they just didn't. When things went bad, they sort of disappeared. Um, and uh, I remember specifically, I had a patient, I had a, an oncologist uh, ask me to see 
a 16-year-old boy who was, uh, had a very, very bad bone cancer. And uh, I remember when he called me, he, a, a fairly prominent uh, pediatric oncologist nationally, and he called me and he said, okay, Stuart, I want you to see this guy. And I said, yeah, okay, I'd be happy to do it. And he said, uh, I don't want you to crap out on this one. I, wa I want, if you take this on, I want you to stay till the end. Well, I mean, it's not like I'd crapped out on him on other patients or anything, but it was, an, and I thought, boy, that's interesting. And, uh, and this was a kid that uh, was just a fabulous uh, kid, had a fabulous family, a fabulous mother, and, um, and he went through um, nasty treatments, went home, came back in, and eventually died. And I got very, very involved with him and his family. Um, and I, I mean, I actually found myself uh, neglecting my own family in some ways, uh, you know, going in there to see him on weekends and, and things like that. And uh, at one point, uh, he, he, there was a crisis because his oncologist, this guy that I talked about, used to come to see him, and, uh, and this is when things were really going bad, and would just open the door and stick his head in and say, how are you today? And one day he did this, and uh, this kid, John, who was a pretty, pretty amazing kid, started yelling at him. So what the hell's wrong with you? What are you afraid of me? Why don't you come in here? I, I, I hate you, whatever. And the guy calls me, and the, the oncologist calls me and tells me this story, and I go and talk to the kid, and he's really angry. And, um, and, and the oncologist says to me, you know, maybe we should find him another doctor. And I, I said, you know, I don't think that's, I don't think he wants another doctor. I think that would really freak him out if you said, why don't you find another doctor? I think he wants you to come in his room and talk to him. So it's, it's really interesting what he did. What he did was he showed up with a clown mask and he didn't come in the room, but he knocked on the door, opened the door, and he had a clown mask on, and he said, how are you doing today, and then left. Uh, but it worked. I, I mean, it, it was a very interesting reaction uh, on his part, and that it sort of worked for the kid. The kid wasn't so angry anymore and didn't expect it of him. But anyway, the, the kid died eventually, and I was there when he died. And uh, it was a, like a Saturday afternoon, and the doctor came in. The doctor was not with him when he died, but the doctor came in. And what the doctor did was, because I, 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 I spent a couple hours there because I was with the family and so forth, this doctor went and he, all the other, I mean, there maybe 10 other kids on this ward with cancer, and they all knew that this kid had died. I mean, they all knew each other, and he went and was talking with every parent on that ward. Now, I don't know what he said to them. He might have said, your kid's not going to die. Don't worry. I don't know. What, but he came in, and he spent time with them. And, um, and I thought, especially when I stopped doing this, I thought, I couldn't do what he does day in and day out talking to these children and their parents about their horrible illness and their dying, I just couldn't do it. So I, I guess my thought about that is that uh, it's, it's a really special person. I've known a few hospice nurses that are, are like this, and they're usually unusual people, not necessarily the happiest people in the world. This is my, this isn't, this is anecdotes, not data that I'm telling you, but to people who somehow this is their calling and they do it really well and they do it day in and day out all the time. They're there for those patients. They look them in the eye. They listen to them. They feel and identify with what's going on with those patients, which I think is the only way you can really communicate with them and help them. So I really respect people who can do it, but I think it's probably unreasonable that we should expect that everybody can do that day in and day out. And therefore, 
I think care to people who are dying in the hospital, in the acute care setting, uh, should be done by teams. So there all should be, all, it, so the doctor with a mask, okay, but he needed me there. And I, I mean, he, I wasn't part of the team, but he called me in, and, and when you look back on it, he knew what was gonna happen, and he, he knew he wasn't gonna be there, and he wanted me to be there. And he was taking care of his patient in his own way, in that way. So I mean, these things, this insight, which I think is probably correct, uh, didn't come to me in a flash at the time. It sort of sunk in over the years. That this is, this is what was really going on there, okay. So, um, right about the same time, uh, high-tech medicine hit. Uh, when I went to medical school, there were no intensive care units in the hospital. There was a surgical recovery room, which was the closest thing to, a, uh, to um, a, an intensive care unit. And, uh, very quickly uh, in the in the 70s, uh, you know, the mechanical ventilator, positive pressure mechanical ventilator came into being, and other things. And suddenly we had a lot of uh, intensive care units. I mean, now major hospitals like Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals in Cleveland, now 30, 35 percent of their beds are intensive care unit beds. Uh, amazing, uh, surgical intensive care unit. Uh, thoracic surgery intensive care unit, neuro intensive care unit, cardiac intensive care unit, pediatric intensive care unit, uh, preemie intensive care unit, and so on and so forth. So there, there may be seven or eight different types of intensive care units in hospitals today. And uh, it, when this medicine, when this high tech medicine came in, there was a technological imperative, which was that if you have it, you should use it. This is life-saving stuff, it was very exciting. The doctors that used it got very excited about it for very good reasons that they wanted to save people, but also they were just into the technology. And, and I think the American public and people became very enamored of technology, and we still are. But it wasn't, a, th this happened in my career, in my career. And it was right at the time that I was talking to patients who were dying. So, this, uh, this technology gives us, uh, physicians and nurses, the people who administer it, uh, a sense of power and control. It gives the families who are asked about whether it should be used a sense of power and control. Uh, and it does give a certain sense of control, um, but it also, I, I think, looking back on it, it at least in my experience, in my visual field and experiential field, we stopped talking about dying. We started talking about should we keep people alive or not. So the, the, the literature and the attention seemed to focus on whether we should use high technology or not. If it was too much, we should stop. Should we write a DNR order? And in a way, Nobody was dying anymore. In the old days, remember the old TV shows or movies, you know, the families in the hospital in the waiting room, the doctor comes in and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And everybody cries, and that's, it's not the death, but it's a, a, a very important milestone in the, de the death of patients. Well, they can't say that anymore. There's always something more they can do, almost always. And, uh, and, and so it was tough to say somebody's dying. And, and at least in my experience, a lot of the, at least in the hospital, the discussion was really about how aggressive should we be. And it wasn't about, okay, it's here and we're dealing with it. We're dealing, we're facing death with nothing in between. Now there's lots of decisions in between, worries about rights and all that stuff. So um, this is technology. So this was, when I was a kid, this was high technology. These are iron lungs that were, that this was before the positive pressure uh, respirator was invented. So you had, uh, do I have a cursor here? 
Can, yeah, okay. So th these are um, cylinders that are sealed. Uh, you have the patient's head coming out, but there's a, a rubber uh, sort of uh, necklace or whatever uh, around their neck and that doesn't let the air in or out. And, and then at the, at the foot here is a bellows. So when the bellows expands, uh, it causes or, or contracts, it, it causes a vacuum inside the iron lung and uh, it, it, it expands the chest of the patient and th therefore air is sucked in through the patient's mouth. And these, these things are portals on the side that are also sealed but that people can put their hands in to you know, give injections or take blood or touch the patient. They're pretty isolating. Uh, and this was replaced by the positive pressure ventilator where instead of having this big machine, you have a pretty little machine that is attached to a, a tube that goes into the trachea either through the mouth or the nose and then it, it inflates the lungs with positive pressure. Uh, it leaves the patient uh, exposed, their body, uh, uh, so that people can touch them or <coughs> hold them, but it also keeps them from speaking. Uh, which is uh, another problem. But along with, with the positive pressure ventilator came pacemakers, uh, drugs that could raise blood pressure, uh, dialysis, and, and really many things that could support organs uh, for a period of time or indefinitely that had failed. And uh, this next uh, cartoon or whatever sort of symbolizes uh, what we can do now. Uh, so, we talked about the technological imperative. The other thing that happened uh, during that period of time, uh, well, not immediately, but, but pretty quickly and then gathered momentum, is that we started having the experience, we meaning our society, doctors and nurses, but also uh, patients and their families, of uh, being kept alive uh, when being kept alive wasn't so great. And it's being kept alive so that you can go home is one thing, but being attached to a ventilator and dialysis for a long time in an intensive care unit with no hope of getting out isn't so great. And so people started uh, looking at the issue of whether death is sometimes the least worst alternative. So it's not something that we want. People don't want, do you want to die? Well, if you ask patients, if you gave them complete power who, when they're in these situations and said, do you want to die? They say no. Well then, you know, heal yourself and go home. They do it. It's not that they want to die. It's that they'd rather choose death than the kind of life that they're leaving. And we really started having a lot of experience with that as a society. And I would guess that today, most of the people in this room, even the younger people in the room, have grandparents or uncles or aunts or neighbors who have experienced this kind of thing. Uh, when I gave lectures about this in the 70s, people didn't. They'd look at me, really? But it's, it's pretty hard now to escape this uh, in, your, in your life, uh, in your social uh, interactions and so forth. And this recognition has touched off another debate that uh, was waiting in the wings, and that is um, if you accept that death can sometimes be the least worst alternative, which is if you're willing to abandon a vitalist view of things, which is that you have to reek out and squeeze out every second of life that you possibly can, no matter how invasive, painful, undignified, or unwanted that treatment is, um, then you're saying that we can choose death sometimes. And it turns out that in the United States, I don't know, there are two and a half million deaths every year. And almost all of them, 90%, there's some decision made not to uh, to be aggressive, to stop being aggressive or to not start being aggressive. So, I mean, with, with our EMS systems in the United States, nobody is far away from technological intervention. 
And uh, once you're in a hospital or a nursing home, you're, so, so in most deaths today, a decision has to be made about whether to prolong life or not at some point. I mean, it might be a decision at the end of whether to prolong it for a few minutes, or it might be earlier for a few days or a few weeks or even years, but it happens all the time. And we've had a very robust uh, debate in the United States that's been pretty transparent in the courts, in the newspapers, in literature, movies, uh, about this idea that death can be the least worst alternative and facing the fact that now what used to be in the hands of fate or God, which is the time that we died, is now a matter of deliberate human decision most of the time. So we're controlling the timing of death. And this is an awesome responsibility, and it's one that um, many people are very uncomfortable with. And I think it's one that families in particular are very uncomfortable with. So this is when I use the term the illusion of control and the sense of responsibility. This is what I'm saying. I mean, you're not going to save the patient, uh, but you have this choice about giving up. Uh, and giving up it might mean that the patient dies sooner, and you see that either right in front of you or the next day. And so in some way, you're attached uh, emotionally, uh, psychologically, and ethically to, quote, causing death. Now, we can use words and say, oh, I didn't cause it. I allowed it to happen. And I'm going uh, to end here. Uh, well, these are some of the states that people can be in. Uh, these, this is a young woman like Karen Ann Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan, who was in a PVS on the cover of Life. And this is, uh, this is Nancy, all know Nancy Cruzan. I, this is one of these moments where the young people in the audience say, Nancy Cruzan? Uh, so Nancy Cruzan, uh, have you studied Nancy Cruzan? Oh, all right. Oh, right, you made him read it, good. Uh, so, you know, she was, she was one of the landmark cases in the United States, was in PVS, persistent vegetative state, for a while, and family wanted to stop uh, feeding artificial fluids and nutrition, and it went uh, in, into the courts and actually all the way up to the Supreme Court. And eventually, uh, they allowed uh, the treatment to be withdrawn. So this is her tombstone. And you see it says the date she was born, which is July 20th, 1957, departed January 11th, 1983. That's when she was, uh, had her event that caused her to be in a persistent vegetative state. And then at peace, December 26th, 1990, and that's when they stopped feeding and she died. So this is an example of that, that space and time where decisions are made that are painful, difficult decisions. It's not, um, it's not surprising. Uh, when we started this discussion back in the 70s in our society about the least worst death, uh, or death being the least worst alternative and controlling uh, time of dying, uh, there were people, vitalists, religious fundamentalists, who said, you're starting down a slippery slope. Life is sacred and sacred in a way that we have an obligation and a vitalist way to maintain it. And if you give that up, if you start chipping away on that, the next thing you know, you're going to be talking about active euthanasia. And, and they, they were right. They were right. Now, is that a bad thing? They think it's a bad thing. Uh, but. The, the other argument is that we went up a slope. And the slope we went up was we gave people rights to live their lives and die their deaths in a way that they wanted, rather than the way somebody else wanted or the technological imperative insisted on. So it's, it's usually true with slippery slope that one man's slippery slope is another man's ascent. And you know, there are, there are trade-offs. In, on all slopes, up or down. So 
we are discussing uh, active euthanasia in our society. We have uh, physician-assisted suicide is legal now in four states. And uh, in the Netherlands, it's completely legal under, you know, not wanton uh, active euthanasia, but under certain circumstances it is. In Belgium, it is. Um, and uh, I, I would argue that what we do in the United States is pretty close, uh, even in places where it's not allowed. So l let me get to my, uh, let me get to my. Finally, okay. So this is what I call the active-passive continuum. What's happened in the United States is that we, we have, as a, as a society, not 100%, but a big majority, and the courts for sure, have said that death can be the least worst alternative and that we're allowed to stop treatments or not start treatments. And we've had a debate because not all treatments feel the same when you stop them or you don't start them. And I think that there's, this is the continuum that I'm talking about. So on the left is the do everything, the vitalist continuum. And at the right is the lethal injection, which is what they do in the Netherlands, where you, yeah, I, if you drop uh, drugs in a syringe that are going to make the person go to sleep, stop breathing, and stop their heart, and you put it in their vein and you inject it, it's hard to argue that you're just letting nature take its course. That term doesn't really work there. Uh, but what we've done as we've accepted uh, different kinds of interventions to stop treatment uh, or not start treatment, we've justified them morally by saying we're honoring patients' autonomy or we're doing it in a beneficent way that they're suffering and the treatment is just increasing or prolonging suffering. And therefore, there can be times when we can stop treatment, even knowing that the patient will die as a result. So uh, these different points have really different, uh, I think, moral significance, but certainly psychological significance in the terms of a sense that you're killing the patient. So as you move to the right on this continuum, there's a greater sense of responsibility for killing the patient. Uh, um, so DNR order. So the DNR order was very controversial when it first came out. Uh, nobody wrote DNR orders. We discovered cardiopulmonary resuscitation relatively recently in the 70s. It wasn't approved by the American Heart Association until 1973, an intervention where you could bring people back from the jaws of death. Um, we found out that it didn't work very well most of the time. So you know, the data for the world uh, is that uh, in, ho in hospital arrests where people resuscitated, uh, something like 14% lived to leave the hospital. So it's not, it's not in, in, in certain patients that approach zero, and in others it's much. So selectively, if you have a young person who has a, is healthy and has an isolated cardiac event, resuscitation has a pretty good chance of succeeding. In somebody who has a three organ system failure, uh, it's not going to work. And so we decided we shouldn't always do it, but at that time, it was considered radical to write a DNR order. In fact, people worried they'd go to jail if they wrote a DNR order. And th there was a big scandal in New York where a couple hospitals were uh, not resuscitating patients, but not writing it in the chart, not writing an order. They had little blue uh, stickies that they put on the, the nursing notes, which didn't used to be in the chart either. And, and then they'd remove it after the, after the patient died. And this was uncovered. And it made them look like they were doing something really bad. And then there was a big discussion nationally about DNR. And people started developing DNR policies. And hospitals today all have DNR policies. But DNR is, again, considered, it was people said, well, you're killing the patient. I mean, that term was used. I mean, you're killing the patient. 
But if you think about it, you write a DNR order, the patient doesn't die when you write the order. Uh, the patient dies sometime later when their heart stops and you don't try to start it. And it turns out half the people who have DNR orders written in the hospital don't arrest and leave the hospital. So this is, as, I, as I'm saying on this continuum, your, your connection with the death of the patient is pretty distant. It may not happen. You may not be in the hospital when it happens. You may be on a different rotation when it happens, et cetera. Then we get to, at the end, uh, and I, I'm not going to go through all these because I want to have time for discussion, but you know, then we had debates about, well, could you stop dialysis? Could you turn off a ventilator? Now there's one that's closer to the right. If, you know, when you turn off a ventilator, a patient dies right in front of you. Uh, and uh, if you stop dialysis, the patient will die, but people aren't on dialysis machines. They're sent for dialysis three times a week. So it's not like you switch off the machine and they die. They come back from dialysis on Monday and you don't send them back on Wednesday and the next week they die. So the decision is the same, has the same consequence, but it doesn't feel the same. But now we have things like terminal sedation, where we put people to sleep um, and they die when they're asleep, uh, and we may not feed them during that period of time. And uh, because it's okay now, that was another one of the big debates, one of the arrows that's close to the killing uh, feeling, and that's stopping fluids and nutrition. And that was the Nancy Cruzan case. And now that's considered uh, legally acceptable and morally acceptable by most people, although it's a harder one to do. Terminal sedation is, is there. Uh, giving people um, morphine to stop their pain, even though you know it may stop them from breathing, double effect, uh, that's done and it's not illegal. But there you really are killing the patient. I mean, you give them morphine, your intention is to stop their pain. You know it may kill them. So the, the, the moral argument of double effect is that's OK, because that wasn't what you, it was foreseen, but it wasn't intended. Uh, but you, if you put the morphine in and the person dies, you did kill them. I mean, you might not have done it intentionally, but you did kill them. So it's getting closer and closer. And then physician-assisted suicide is one more step. Well, I didn't kill the patient, but I gave the patient medicine so the patient could kill themselves. So I'm, I'm not sure where this is going to go in the United States. I, I think that politically, uh, raising the idea of, of active euthanasia is probably not feasible uh, in most of the country. And we're actually not even seeing a big, uh, I, I, we're going to have marijuana legal uh, in more states before we have physician-assisted suicide legal. Uh, but uh, I think that's, we've come up against that where the denial of responsibility is, is impossible in, in, that, in those situations, so they're much harder to accept. Uh, whether they're right or wrong, I'm not going to get into that in, in this discussion unless you ask me some questions about it.